after around 40 years uh, of prison time, it's been real difficult for me. I don't know if you remember the show, um, it was a cartoon. I'm just throwing this so to give you an idea how I feel. You had the Flintstones and then the Jetsons. I went in when I was the Flintstones and I come out with the Jetsons. Everything is space for me now. Um, I still have trouble adjusting um, people, uh, even traffic lights. I don't even know how to push a button. I can't even find it to stop, you know what I mean? So, so that you can cross and the red light comes on. Um, going into places, the mall, with a lot of people, uh, including using the telephone. Uh, I use the telephone and uh, I, I got into two seizures by using the telephone. I'm still having trouble with the telephone, but I'm working on it. Um, just, it's nice to be out, believe me, don't get me wrong, but it's just it's a whole different world, different people. All I remember was the 1970s. I'm still stuck on the 1970s. But like I said, it's, it's been a long time, um, and I have a long battle and a long way to go to adjust. It's not simple. I'm working on it. When it came with the feds, I, I got more frustrated because, you know, as I was walking out, I was going to a halfway house, and the lieutenant pulled me to the side and he said, listen, I'm going to share something with you because you've been in a long time. You're going to a different world. You're going to a halfway house. It's designed for failure. Remember that. When you get there, it's designed for failure for you to come back and, 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 and end up wrapping up your entire sentence. He was correct. Um, I left. They gave me a pair of pants. No, actually, they didn't give me a pair of pants. I had a hard time getting a jacket from them because it, the weather was kind of cool. Um, the sweatpants that I left with was the ones that I had in there in the sweatshirt. Oh, they gave me a pair of underwears and a pair of socks and a, and a jacket that I had a, I had a pretty much fight just to get it. Uh, they wouldn't give me anything. For money, I think they gave me the halfway house. They gave me like 40 something dollars. And that was for my travel to eat one meal and to take a taxi when I get to downtown. I came two minutes late and they were gonna send me back. It's unbelievable and it wasn't really my fault. It was just a taxi issue that it takes time. Well, I had a um, bottle of water and a pack of cigarettes. Um, the guy took my water from me and took my cigarettes and says I can't bring nothing from the outside, I can't smoke. So automatically, just this tone coming off to me, I, I, I didn't really like it. Um, I went through hell just to get out of prison. I was happy to get out, but I went through hell. It was frustrating. The bus, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to get the tickets. I had to ask questions. I'm standing looking like a dummy. One of the security guys came over to me, said, listen. And, and I looked at him and said, what you want? Because automatically I see him dressed in blue, so I thought he was gonna give me a hard time. And he says, no, 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 I'm, I'm just here to help you. I said, why do you want to help me for? He said, because you're lost. And I looked at him and he caught me. He caught me in suspense in that moment. I had to think what he was saying. He said, I know you got out. I, I can tell by the clothes, you, nobody wears grays no more. If you wear gray, it's because you come out of prison. You have a flag for everybody to see this. And it was amazed that he can identify me so quick. But he did help me and I thanked him. I really did because I was embarrassed. I didn't know where to go. It's just frustrating just to get off the bus and don't know what to do. I'm stuck. It's like I had glue on my shoes and I couldn't move. You want to move, but you can't because you don't know what's next, what to do. Like I said, when you live in prison, it's a different way of life. And, and you get accustomed to that. You're programmed to do what you got to do. But when you come out, you just don't know what to do. You're trying to think, well, you know, if I do this, I don't want to make a mistake and, and stand out. I'm trying to keep a low key, low profile. Of course, it was difficult with my tattoos to do. But like I said, uh, when I got to the halfway house, it was even more difficult for me because um, some people were not very friendly. Um, I was lucky, fortunate to end up in a two man room because I don't do four or I don't do six men. It's difficult to live with one person, I remember another four or five people. Um, I got some good roommates there. Unfortunately, I was not able to go anywhere. Uh, the only thing I got the most was only a two hour pass to go get some um, personal hygienes. 
So I really didn't get a chance to see the streets. Um, I pretty much was, was in prison there. And I asked them to send me back to prison because if you're not gonna let me out and see the world and let me get adjusted, then send me back. Um, it came to a point in time there that um, we started beefing. We started beefing because since they wouldn't give me a pass, they went, oh, by the way, when I, they did give me a few uh, two hour pass for work, to go look for work. I found, I think about four or five jobs and they came in, they asked for me. And what happened was that the lady downstairs was in charge of that program for work. She's the one that received the calls and give you the appointment and give you the passes to go for this job. She was giving my job to somebody else because she didn't like me. Unfortunately, when I went there, I was profiled because of my tattoos and the type of time and the violent crimes that I got. One of the guys worker that worked there, he liked me, he pulled me to say, said, listen, I'm nobody here. I'm just a case manager. He said, but you gotta watch your step because nobody likes you. He said, why? He said, because your tattoos and your background of history. You're the only one in this halfway house. I think it was probably about 36 people. And they have females downstairs. It was a co-ed. And he says, uh, you're the only one with your, your type of record here. So they don't really want you here. They're really afraid of you. And they, they want you out of here. So I, when I got there, I, I had minuses against me automatically. As much as I tried to do the program there, they wouldn't even let me go to the programs. I supposed to participate in the program. They said, no, you can stay in the room. You're okay, you're excused. Because they felt me showing up with my tattoos, everybody's looking at me. It's taking their attention away from what they're doing. And uh, that's not my fault. I supposed to be there the program to help me adjust. And they didn't even want me there. It became really tough there that um, what happened was they sent me to another halfway house up in uh, um, Newport News. Uh, and that one was, they really, they treat me, they heard what happened, they felt bad, they told me it was wrong what they did, but they treat me pretty good. I got more passes, I started going out, I started seeing the world. And I spent a lot of time in the park, really thinking, looking in the water, and kind of like, you know, I felt real comfortable there. After that, uh, I went to the Union Mission, a shelter home. Uh, it was a nice place. It, they do help. Unfortunately, they got rid of me because <laughs> I had a relationship with one of the ladies there who was the mother of my daughter. And I guess when she told them who I was, they told me I had to leave, so I was homeless again. From there, I went to the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army. They got rid of me too, they didn't want me there, they gave me a hard time, pretty much because of who I am, my background, criminal life, and the type of time I've got because a lot of people don't want to deal with somebody who has 40 years. So my coming home was very stressful. It's very, I didn't have anybody to say, hey, yeah, come on, man, I'll help you out. Um, here's the employment office. Um, th this is the store over here. This is where you buy this here. This is how you use a cell phone. I didn't have that. Um, people were not open arms with me. But like I said, my, I said the last time, I, I'm used to that. I'm used to being alone. Um, it doesn't bother. It's, I'm lonely. Yeah, of course I am. But I'm, I'm used to it because guys like me, and I'm not the only one. Guys like me has to live that way. That's the way of life for us. You know. Um, it's really tough adjusting, it really is, and, it's, and the, the main thing that I have a problem with is trusting. I can have a really good guy come to me and want to, and want to help me, and I'm thinking he's up to something. He wants something from me, and um, because the way of life in prison, you don't trust nobody. Not your mother, not your father, you don't trust nobody. So adjusting is really tough. It's, I'm, I'm, I gotten a little better, but I'm still having problems adjusting. The hardest thing for me when I, after wrapping up all those years, 40 years that I served, was technology. Um, I was getting off the Greyhound bus, and I think this was in Maryland. In Maryland. I forgot what city it was, but it was in Maryland, up by D.C. And I was thirsty. I was so thirsty, so I went to go get a bottle of water. And so I'm looking at the machine, the Coke machine, because that's where the water's at. And I'm looking at it, and I had no clue where to put the money in. I didn't know how it works. 
And I was staring at it, and a lady and a guy that was working there came over and says, uh, you must have just gotten out. And I looked at him, and I was just embarrassed. You know, I, I didn't know what to say. My face turned pale. And the guy said, listen, everything's cool, man. We're just here to help you, you know? And so he said, give me the money. I'll show you how to do it. And actually, he gave me back my money. He bought it for me. He felt so bad. Um, I watched him do it, and I, didn't, I said, I didn't know where you put the money in there. I said, what happened to the other style of Coke machines where you just put the coins in and it was easy? He said, I did away with that. He said, so, he said how long have you been gone? I told him 40 years. He said, you know, he said, oh my God, he was shocked. I went through a culture shock. I, I think that's the right word for that, culture shock. Um, the, thing, the other things were like, I still don't know how to use a washing machine or a dryer. Um, I don't know where to put the money at. I don't know how it works. I don't know where you put the detergent at or where it goes because they, they look different. It's not the same what I left in the 70s. I have a friend. Um, I asked my friend for a favor um, if I can use the tub. The person told me, sure, you can go take a shower. I said, well, I appreciate that too, but I really want to wash my clothes. And the person looked at me and said, well, you know, they got a laundry mat down here. And I told the person, I don't know how to use the machine. I don't know how to use a washer or dryer. And so what I do is I take my clothes and I put it in the tub and wash it by hand. I wring it out, soak it, and do the same process over until it's clean and then I hang them out. This is the same method that I used while I was locked up for 40 years. And this is the way I know how to do things is I wash my own clothes by hand. So I have no clue of technology phones. I'm still having a hard time with them. Uh, like I said, I had, I had seizures just dealing with the phones, having it next to my ear and then all that. I don't know what happened, but uh, I had two seizures. I got hurt. I, I woke up full of blood. I hit the ground really high and I busted my head open and everything. You know, like automobiles, I was good with automobiles. I can tell you from the 70s, charges and all that, these new cars, I got no clue. I don't even know what they are. Um, it, it's just, I'm out of place, I'm out of time. I feel like I'm a man that was frozen in ice and, and, and somehow it was thawed out probably a thousand years later, coming to a new type of world. I feel out of place, I feel like I don't belong. I, I, I just don't feel like I belong here. Um, I, I really feel that way a lot. It's tough. It, it really is. Even, you know something, you know, the biggest thing that I had was fear. Believe it or not, uh, you figure, you know, this guy's a tough guy, he went to 40. No, I, I fear too because I'm human. I have feelings. I fear coming out here and don't know what to expect. Even going shopping. Um, I can't walk in a store. <clears throat> when I was with my baby's mama, she took me to a shopping mall. Um, as we walking in and when the door opens and I seen all those people, I had a panic attack. I couldn't deal with being around so many people all at once like that. And you know what's crazy is that I felt more comfortable being with killers and convicts and serious people, but I was around people who were harmless and I was afraid of them. I was more afraid of them and I don't know why. I went running back to the car. She chased me. It took her, probably took me about an hour and a half to go in there. And even still then I was uncomfortable, I was sweating. That's when my anxiety kicked in. Um, I still have that problem when I go into, if I go into a store, everybody stops. If I go in to get me a hot dog, everybody stops eating and looks at me. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. Um, I guess I have an aura, maybe my tats, the way I walk, um, I don't really smile. I don't think I need to smile unless I know the individual. <clears throat> so, you know, I, it's part of adjusting and I still have trouble with that. Since I've been out um, looking for work, I've filed a lot of applications, uh, interviews, I've had no success. It's been really tough for me to find work. A lot of it, like I said, is the profile from the past background history, my tattoos. But today, um, I have an interview, the first interview in seven months, and um, I'm really happy. 
Um, I'm applying for a maintenance job, but it's a part-time. But yeah, today would be um, hopefully a, a lucky day for me. Um, I'm counting my blessings. Um, even if I have to flip burgers, it don't matter. As long as I'm getting a little income because it helps me. It helps me plan my goals that I want to do. My apartment, get my car, have some traveling money for now to get on the bus until I achieve to that level that I want to get. I got to begin somewhere. I begin in the bottom of the barrel, work my way up. So I don't have a problem what type of job it is, but as long as I work. But since seven months I've been out, I've been struggling to get a job and it's my first opportunity today and I'm really happy. That brings some joy to me. The job is uh, McDonald's. What happened was I went online um, and then I went in person because they didn't answer me on my way downtown and I stopped in and I talked to the individual, the manager. The good thing I like about him is that he, even though he looked at my tattoos, he showed it. I can tell by body language that it didn't really matter about my tattoos. He said, listen, I'll tell you what, let me get your name and number and I'm gonna to talk to the other manager. And so yesterday he called me and I was very surprised. I was really happy and I, I was in joy. I thanked him a hundred times and I said, sure, I'll be there tomorrow, which is today. So I, I'll be a, a maintenance. I'm, I'm applying for a maintenance job at McDonald's. You know, if, if they decided that I go clean the toilet bowl, bathroom, mop floors, wipe walls, pick up somebody's crap, guess what, I'm gonna do it because I'm gonna put on gloves, it don't matter. So it doesn't matter what I do, I need a job and I'm gonna do it. I don't care what it is, I'm gonna do it because um, I have to make some income. You can't survive out here without income and you can't survive out here after serving 40 years without, you gotta start somewhere, man. You really gotta start somewhere and this is a start for me. My, um, my goals and my dreams since I've come out of prison is uh, I like to have my own place. Um, I like to be safe, you know. I don't feel safe um, living on the street. I like to have my own house where, or my own apartment where I can say this is mine, you know, where I can go and lay up and sleep. I don't sleep hardly anyways. I'm, I'm lucky if I get two or three hours a night sleep. Um, I like to get a nice job. Um, I have a lot of talents, skills. Unfortunately, I can't get an opportunity to get it done. And also, I, I like to have a car. I like to own a car um, so I can get around. Walking, I do a lot of walking. Um, probably about a good five to 10 miles a day, maybe more. But those are my dreams and my goals, and to find nice people people who really care. I know there's people out there. There's, there's, I, I still in my heart, I believe there's still good people out there. Find those people and um, develop some type of trust and friendship. You know, I'm pushing 60. I would like to lay back and um, like to have somebody call a friend. You know, it, It's a nice feeling. I haven't had a friend in heaven knows how long. <laughs> I, I know it's more than 40 years ago that I had a friend. Um, you know, walk the beach, you know, um, visit places. Um, I haven't been places. Um, nice restaurant. I'm afraid to walk in a restaurant with my tattoos. Um, people look at me. Uh, they look at me funny. I feel uncomfortable. Uh, you know, go to a place where I can sit on and eat a nice fat steak. You know what I mean? Nice fat one about that big, and I haven't tasted one in a long time. Um, just do things that people do to make them happy, and, and that's what I seek for. And live a peaceful life. I really want a peaceful life. Mm -hmm.